everybody. Um, I am so excited that we are getting together on Monday nights to talk about optimizing success and what successful people do. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Ruth Gotian. My background's in adult learning and leadership, and I research what makes people successful and what are some of the things that we can do as we learn from these successful people just to make ourselves <coughs> more successful. Now, how did this all start? So 24 years ago, I used to run an MD PhD program and I was surrounded by these overachievers. And the admissions committee used to sit in my office as they would look through the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications. Now note there was only a 3% acceptance rate for this program. So this is the creme de la creme. And they would put stars on certain applications. And I went up to them and I said, well, what are these stars? What does that mean? They said, oh, these are going to be superstars. And I said, oh, okay, let's wait and see. So this program was seven to eight years and some were in fact superstars and some were okay. And after a while, I realized that I could figure out who were going to be the shining stars later on in their careers. I didn't know why I knew, but I just knew. So when I got my doctorate, I decided to investigate the most successful physician scientists of our generation, those who have the MD and who do research to figure out what made them so successful. So I thought there were so many people looking into what was called the leaky pipeline, why people start in a career and then leave. I was more interested in those who are so, success, so successful, say that quickly, that they leave everyone else in the dust. That if they are as productive as they are, we don't need as many. We need to just produce more people like that. So I started studying them and researching what makes people so successful. And now I write for Forbes and I talk to other successful people like astronauts and Olympic athletes. And I'm part of this great group, many of the people who are on this Zoom now, who are such high achievers in their own right. And I think that there are things that we can all learn from these high achievers. We might never win the Nobel. We might never compete in the Olympics. But there are things we can learn from these high achievers who have accomplished so much, and we can start doing some of those things to be more professional in our own lives. And I know this, that this works because I've taken some of these pieces and I've made some of these changes both in my own life and to the people I work with. And these micro changes have an enormous, enormous impact. So I can tell you what the most successful people do, but that's a PowerPoint. And I could just email that to you. I could just give you a keynote about that. I can write about that. But I thought it would be much more interesting to hear the stories of these really, really successful people and how they got there. And I will just interject throughout to just probably illuminate certain points so that you understand how this is not a one-off. This is really some of the things that they all do and they might not even realize that they are doing it. So I am so thankful that you guys are all here. And um, hey, Liana, so nice of you to join us. Thank so you. Um, I thought we would start with the only guy who is on this Zoom right now. And I'm hoping that uh, everyone else who's watching on Facebook Live, if you have questions, um, just type it in and we will as a collective try to answer them from our own experiences. Um, so Mr. Brad Kane, with your new book in the background, Pitchfork Populism, um, congratulations on the book. And even before the author, before he became a great author. He is a lawyer. He has worked in government his entire life. Um, and what a lot of people may or may not know is that a year ago, he was the speechwriter for Congressman Maxine Waters. So how did you get from this guy who was interested in law and government to writing speeches to one of the most recognizable faces in Congress? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me join you. Um, 
the the important thing about my path is that I believe it's something that's replicable for anyone. And that's the important part of this, of course. Um, the, the thing that matters most, I believe, is for people to find their passion. So of course, we're not, we can set aside, first of all, the people who, you know, the prodigy who's composing a Beethoven-like symphony at age seven. Um, you know, there's some like that. We, we, don't, we don't need to get into that. But for uh, mere mortals, um, and, and obviously it helps in terms of one's, uh, one's environment growing up in terms of support and, and having confidence instilled. But even if one is missing that and one reaches a point of early adulthood and maybe has not had the advantage of that, um, I believe that anyone can succeed if they follow certain elements. One thing is none of us are outstanding at everything. The important thing is to figure out both what you care about because that's your passion and what you're good at. And, you know, because the thing is, if you go into a job and you're just, you know, one thing, it, it's fine to push the envelope a little bit. We all, you know, it's always beneficial to push it a little bit to learn, to be able to soak up knowledge from other people who are around you. But if you're completely fish out of water, you're not gonna do well. It's gonna hurt your spirit. It's gonna hurt your reputation. You're not gonna like your job and it's a downward spiral completely the opposite for having those things intact. So if you, if you identify what you really care about, what you drive, what drives you, and it's like the old expression, which you know, I don't know who created it, but it's been a watchword for me is, if you love what you're doing, you don't work a day in your life. So you know, love what you're doing, because then you're, you're fired up every single day, you wake up and you can't wait to get to work and you know, pick up where you left off, or put in place your, your new ideas. So that's part of it. But then there are a lot of other elements to it. And I'll, 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 cut, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, let's see where you, and, and yeah, so, you know, where it's you'd like. interesting that you say that because of all the successful people that I've spoken to, they all say that what they are doing, yes, they have the passion for it. Yes, they're intrinsically motivated. How many of you just here on the Zoom would do your job for free if you could, right? They have all found their passion. And that is what successful people do is they find what they love doing. They would do it for free if they could. So even when you have those bad days that you know you didn't win the medal, you didn't run as fast as you wanted, you didn't get the grant you wanted, your, your book was rejected, you would still continue because you know that's just a step on the path to whatever that goal is. So find your passion and find what you're good at. You're right. See, and I didn't even prep you for this. Can I add two quick thoughts? You can add all the thoughts you want. The important thing is once you're there, the question is how do you take the next step? Um, I'll be happy to drill down on both of these later if you'd like, but two things. One is, especially when you're in your 20s or whatever, early on in your career, find a mentor. Be a sponge. Yes. It doesn't matter if you make five dollars. Doesn't matter about the money. You're going to make money somewhere else down the line. But what you can learn from an expert by just, you know, zipping it and be a sponge, take in every bit of experience from them that you possibly can. It is invaluable. It'll teach you how to be the professional. You may have learned things in school, but you don't know how to put them in place till you do that. Second point is. Um, something I learned kind of also in my 20s is study management and leadership. Because even if you're not in a leadership or management role, those principles are still invaluable, no matter whether it's, it's in a horizontal environment where you're just dealing with your peers, or maybe at some point you will be managing where you do need to, you know, uh, you know manage operations. But one way or another, the principles that you can learn through certain kinds of leadership training and books and courses, leadership and management training will help you no matter where you are, even if you are self-managed and you're your own boss. So I love that you said, um, find a mentor, uh, because some people know I used to, I designed and launched a mentoring academy and it is so critical to have a mentor. The research is crystal clear that those who are mentored outperform and out earn those who don't. 
crystal clear. And we can talk another time about where you find a mentor and how you approach someone and uh, how you approach someone to offer to be a mentor, how you approach someone to ask them to be your mentor, who should be your mentor, mentoring teams. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, and I think the Mentor Project, which is sponsoring this conversation, is the perfect home for this. So that's great. Um, and in terms of leadership, as someone who has a doctorate in leadership, yes, 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 yes. I can't tell you how many people, and Pam and I have discussed this multiple times. In fact, that's how we first met was on a leadership panel. You need to have leadership skills in almost every single job, but nobody teaches you that. Nobody teaches you how to manage teams. No one teaches you how to put together high performance teams. No one teaches you what to do in a crisis. That's why so many leaders are crumbling now during a pandemic. No one has taught them how to lead with empathy. So great points. So what got you from this kid who wanted to be a lawyer to writing speeches for a, a great congresswoman and an author? In my case? Yeah. Um, after law school, I bought a backpack and became a world traveler and was, uh, um, I think I, I don't remember if at the time I was uh, my year in Africa or my year in Europe, but at a certain point I realized I must go to Washington. And I went to Washington and I ended up working in the House of Representatives for eight years at that point. And um, DC is very much in my blood. Uh, but I'm a Californian. I went back to California, worked in state government. Years later, I wrote the book and, to, and I basically wanted to, you know, go full circle and be able to pour my passion, you know, at full throttle, you know, while I was waiting for my book to be published. And I came back to DC and I managed to reconnect with Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And uh, it was uh, an incredible honor to be able to uh, work with her. She's uh, she is a tremendous person and a true force of nature. And how did you connect with her? Um, I, so I, I met her originally many years ago. The, the congresswoman I worked for uh, years ago was also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And through that, that's how I initially met Congresswoman Waters. And then because of California, you know, I you know, see her from time to time as well. So networking, relationships. Oh, networking is, thank you. Networking is one of the huge things that I constantly try to, you know, uh, implore 20 somethings to do. And it's amazing how so many people are scared of networking. But the thing is, and we can talk about, you know, I don't want to, I picked up on, you, you see, you dropped me a breadcrumb. Um, so yeah, we can talk about networking. I think it's absolutely vital. It's, it's part of the way of the world. That's great. Now, Debbie, is there a, a comment there? I'm a little too far from my screen to see. Was there a question from the live stream? Yeah, you have a question from the live stream from Isaiah Swan. Have you ever experienced week, month long periods during which you don't feel that passion? How do you overcome those times? Hi, Isaiah. Isaiah was my student. I am so excited he's joining us. Um, anyone want to chime in? What do you do when you've lost your passion? He's a baseball player too and a budding physician scientist. Liana, Jacqueline, you guys want to chime in? You got to get off mute. Oh, wow, Isaiah, that's a, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I am so excited to be here. I am so excited to be here, <laughs> you guys. Um, so I think that's a phenomenal question, Isaiah, and it's a question that I have been asked my, my whole life, my whole career, because, when you are the visionary, the leader, uh, the team player, the creator of the content, the writer, the author, basically bottle, what do they call it? Chief, bottle washer, and whatever. Yeah, that, that's, Americans have that saying. When you are that, you are also your own, uh, the source of your own inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so your question is phenomenal because uh, I'm going to go back to two weeks ago or three weeks ago and, you know, this was happening here and there was cops everywhere. I'm in Los Angeles and I was a puddle on the floor and I was crying and sobbing and, uh, you know, there wasn't anyone to go and whose shoulder I could cry on. And so your question is a valid for the time that we're in and your question is valid for 
the rest of humanity all the time. Because what do entrepreneurs do when they can't go and knock on someone's heart to get inspiration? I'll tell you what I do. I go back uh, which I rarely do. I don't go back into my history a lot, but I go back to the points in my journal because I journal every night and I go look at the things where I've really actually had an impact that day. And sometimes I don't have to go back further than, I don't know, two weeks to go and see what the most amazing thing that day was. And that really, I mean, it has helped me so tremendously and it puts a smile on my face. Even if it's just, I made a fresh loaf of sourdough bread and I got to feed a whole family with it and they loved it and it was crunching and it was great. So it's a great question you're asking because I can tell you, um, really the authentic part of me will tell you that you're going to have to do that a lot more often than you want to you will have to be your own champion and the light in your own life because the light at the end of the tunnel is you standing there. That's the way it is. That's the true of it. And it's going to happen a lot and it's going to happen often and you're just going to keep smiling and you're going to get through it. And I also dance in my own living room every morning. I don't want to tell you how I dance or what I'm wearing when I'm dancing, but I do a lot of dancing. <laughs> So it's so, Liana, thank you. It is so true that people lose their passion. And it's happened many, many, many times with my students where I have literally had them in my office and I pulled out their application and I pulled out their personal statement, which is why I always recommend people hold on to those personal statements that they use when they apply to school because you have to answer the why. Why do you want to come here? Why do you want to do this? And you really need to dig deep to have an answer that's not synthetic, that the admissions committee will really relate to and connect with. And it's all about the feeling in that personal statement. And I have literally pulled that out for people to remind them of their why. Because the second you remember your why, that is your foundation and that is why you're doing this, right? And I just spoke to someone today who, you know, I said, why did you choose the career that you chose? And he said, because my grandmother passed away when she was 54 and I was eight years old and no other child should have to live through that. Mm. And that was his why. And that's mm -hmm. what he has to go to every single time he has one of those dark days. Yeah, I, I love I love that. I love what you just said. And, you know, there's uh, when your why is bigger than the circumstances you're in. So yeah. when your why is that big, like my why was big because I was a single mother and I was living in Germany. My daughter and I, we were walking in December, walking past a, a vegetable store and they had mangoes in the window and the mangoes were $10 and I had no money. I was a young mom. I was 21. My father had just passed away. I had like nothing. And she said, mom, I want a mango. And I said to her, sweetie, I can't buy you a mango because I got to make sure that there's food on the table. And I never, ever want to be in that position again. And I will never be because my why, okay, well, I'm 61. My daughter's 42. But that piece and delivering that piece with so much passion onto the world and I think that the thing that you said in advance, you said, how many of you would do what you're doing even if it was free? I did it for free for so long. Yeah. And it fueled my passion. So, yeah, thank you. That's right. Dr. Susan, you want to say something? Yes, I agree with everything that you're saying. And this is an end. So I think sometimes when somebody loses their passion, <clears throat> excuse me, and I know this is true for me, it's telling me that I haven't taken enough time off and maybe I need a break. And sometimes taking that break and doing something that has nothing to do with what you're doing, mm -hmm. go, to a, go to a museum, go do something else. You, and sometimes, you know, and I struggle with this. I have to remind myself when I'm starting to feel like that burnout, which to me means, you know, I'm not feeling that passion. I equate that with the feeling of burnout. I go, oh, wait, I know what this means. I need to stop for a minute, even if it's for a couple of hours, I need to like do something completely different. 
I need to go to a museum. I need to watch something silly on Netflix or, you know, just shift it because then suddenly it's like, oh, or take a few days vacation because then you start to miss. If you're on the right track and in your passion and in your why, then you, you'll, you'll miss it if, you, if you're away from it. So get away from it. That's, that's yeah. You're right. Hey, Pam, you want to share my, my <laughs> world traveler friend? Absolutely. Well, I was just going to say something to people that have not reached their why or their passion. They may know their why, but they are not in something that is their passion like we are. Um, one of the things that I did before I got here was uh, uh, something I, uh, it's not my word, it's something we learned in, in my master's in positive psychology. It's called job crafting. And what you want to do is you want to understand your calling. And there's a difference between your calling and a career and a job and work. And if you know which one you're, you're doing and why, because it could be that what you're in is a stepping stone, or it could be that my calling is my family and this allows me to do, you know, it's sort of crafting the, 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 the work you're doing at the moment toward your, your what hopefully will become the, the why and the passion all mixed into one big, um, you know, gift box, if you will. But, but I think that it's interesting because everybody, I always remember listening to people telling me that had quote unquote made it. And it's wonderful to all of us would do our job for free, but there's a lot of people that wouldn't right now. And I think it's interesting to craft that into what it really is in your life so that you know right now this is work but work is going to get me to this and and you know this is going to get me to that and it sort of allows you to be on the path you need to be on that you that you show passion for because you're moving towards something that is your your ultimate goal but um because i could not agree more with everything that was said and i just thought adding that in would sort of give you the rest of the story because it would be wonderful to be in your passion and worry about what to do when you lose it, but some people haven't gotten there yet. That's so great. And I'm so great you brought that in. And I think having your background of positive psychology is so instrumental to this conversation because it could help us get to that why. That it helped me, <laughs> I gotta say. Right? Jacqueline, were you gonna say something, Dr. Jacqueline? I was gonna say, you know, even if people um, have a day gig, right? Like don't quit your day job if you have to put food on the table and there's lots of other um, things people have to do to survive um, while they are um, continuing what they believe is their calling. And um, while you're pursuing your calling or what it is that I feels you. It's so hard to hear you. Really? Is that better? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a low, I'm a low talker. Um, I would say, accept the fact that there is that there is not actually going to be real happiness. Just accept that. What do you mean? I'm saying if you are a creative person, if you are up in the morning and you are energized to do your calling, accept the fact that by nightfall you may feel crushed and deflated and miserable. And regardless of that, just keep doing the work. Do the work. Do the work on good days. Do the work on bad days. Do the work when you're celebrating. Do the work when you're despondent. Just keep doing the work. And eventually, either the world's going to come around, or they're not going to come around, or you'll, you know, you'll be like, Liana, and you'll figure out how to celebrate yourself every day because you'll evolve or whatever. But maybe you will, maybe you won't. But regardless, just stick, stick to so long as you believe it's what you're supposed to be doing, then just plow through. That would be. I'm gonna lose that's that. Like and, and that's really that sense of perseverance that you were talking about is what all of these successful people do. All of these high achievers have. They obviously have a work ethic, but they have this sense, this um, ability to persevere even under the darkest times. So as Isaiah said, what do you do when you lose your motivation over time? They persevere, they keep going, they keep going, they keep going. Because one of the things, and you'll hear me saying this over and over again, they fear not trying 
more than they fear failing. Can so I, can I failing is part of the process, but not trying is simply not an option. So may I add you're something? Not trying more than you fear failing. Who was going to say something? Sorry, Janice. Um, Janice, yes. It's, it's because it's my, I'm not like physical there. But the, when I find that I'm getting like frustrated, I find by doing a slight pivot will make a difference. So when I can't like, I'll hit a roadblock and I'm like, oh, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I'm so sick of this. I will find a different project and then work on that. And then suddenly I'll see something in the project where I was against a wall that I didn't see before. And also by keeping what I call a basket full of projects. So it's not just one direction. So like I work in hearing access. So I would work in museums and I would get so exasperated. So I switched to taxis. Still it's the same fundamental concept, but by pivoting and working taxis, then I get frustrated taxis, I move to the subways or I move to you know, travel or something else. And it, it allowed me to find success in somewhere when the other was being um, obstinate. And you managed to go pretty far with that. Would you mind sharing your why as to why you got into hearing access? And so, then what those accomplishments. So, cause I told people we have a bunch of high achievers here um, you know, on the call today. And I, I just wanna highlight some of all the stuff that you're doing so people know that I'm telling the truth. If I knew we were, if we were involved, I thought I was just watching. That's why I didn't get prepared. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were just like observers. Um, so I have a daughter with a hearing loss. And so because of that, when people told me that there were, um, lowered the bar for her and told me there were special schools for her, I decided that I was upset that people were lowering expectations before she even started. She was two and a half at the time. And why was the bar so low at such an early age? And my idea of special schools was where she went, a private girls' school on the Upper East Side of New York and an Ivy League school. And, but I don't think that's what they meant. And so I decided that I was going to change the world for her so that our family could function and then everyone else benefited. Wow. But along the way, I, the projects I worked on were all out of passion and were based on what our family needed. It was a very selfish endeavor. This was never meant to be like for everybody else. This was just so our family could function. But every time I did get frustrated, I just switched. And then, I would, and then sometimes I would get such success in one, even if I could had a, a roadblock, because some of these projects like the taxi took nine years. So you can imagine how you would become like exasperated can you tell people what you mean by the taxis? I'm in New York, so I know, but there are people all over the world watching. What do you mean by the taxis? So um, the New York City taxis have induction loops. So a person with a hearing loss can hear the driver directly in their hearing aid or cochlear implant. Or if the driver has a hearing loss, they too can hear the, pay, um, the, pers the rider in the taxi. And it was something I had seen in London and brought to New York City. Wow. But it took nine years to do that. And most people would have given up, but when every time I hit a roadblock, I just switched to something else. And then when I would get success, even from that other project, right? One of the many, cause I had a basketball, kind of like the way you, you think of the GDP, right? So, yeah, no, GNP, where you have the, you know, the basketball. I, that's, I took that approach to hearing access. I had a basketball of projects so that this way, nothing ever. And so by then I would switch. And then if I got, I had success in another project, it would help me kind of propel me through the, the difficult one. So you have to just find some success, even if it's a little successes, like Oprah's gratitude thing journal, you gotta find the little successes and then use that to propel you through the hard ones. Cause you're not gonna get the big wins all the time as much as I would like to think you do. That's right. You know, it's interesting we too often focus on all the things we did not accomplish on our to-do list. But there's a practice with um, this group that I'm a part of where we hold ourselves accountable where every Friday we say, it's a brag Friday, what did you accomplish this week? And all of a sudden you see that you've actually really accomplished things, right? When you stop and think about it. And if I didn't have to write it in that, I would not have even remembered that I've accomplished whatever those one, two, three, five things are. So there's never been a week that there's been nothing, 
which was great. Jacqueline? So my kids and I, our, our whole life, have always had what we call the Big Ball Awards, which is a great big exercise ball that sits under the dining room table. And at dinner, we go around and you say why you think you deserve the Big Ball Award. And you deserve it because whether your accomplishment was like a huge thing or just whatever your small thing that you thought was like totally excellent. And then we all decide who deserved it most. And then that means you just get to rest your feet on the big ball. Hi. <laughs> People during Hi. dinner. <laughs> kind of goofy. Can you hear me better now that I have this thing in? So much better. Yes. Oh, thank you. So Liana, were you going to chime in? Yeah. You know, I, um, so I do a lot of transformational work, meaning embody embodiment transformation in the room with action, with dyad, not in the head, but in action. So when we get into a room of like 300 people, we get together and there's an exercise um, that we do, which is to go around and, which is so hard for most of us that we cannot own our own greatness. We are constantly seeking our guilt rather than our own greatness. And not only do that, we do, we do that with us, we do it with others. Instead of seeking their greatness, we're like looking for what's wrong. So there's an exercise that we do. We go around and we say, well, let me tell you what's great about me. And then the other people have to acknowledge it or the person who's in your dyad or triad has to acknowledge it. And then you got to put one on top of that. You say, and let me tell you what else is amazing about me. And, <laughs> and that just takes it to a whole other level. And if you can start doing that just even in your own family, which is, it's like the hardest thing is for the same reason why we can't accept compliments. Like someone comes to you and says, wow, you look so beautiful today. You know, we go, oh God, no. And this little schmata, I just got it at Target. You know, rather than really being the, the magnanimous, thank you, I receive that vessel. Thank you, I receive that. We just like try to push it away rather than saying, yeah, yes. I did good. And that's a practice. That's a, like a lifelong practice. Yeah. And there's a very fine line between us really accepting with grace and becoming arrogant. That's true. So I think that's a perfect segue into imposter syndrome. How many of you have felt imposter syndrome? <laughs> so Imposter syndrome is you feel like you're a fraud and you feel people are going to find out and they're going to throw you out, kick you out, take your award away. It usually happens after something big has happened. Um, you got an award or you got some major achievement. And welcome to the club because 70% of people actually suffer from imposter syndrome at some point. I think the 30% of people who don't have it are probably narcissistic, but I will let the psychologists on the call respond to that. So I think we all have it. Um, and maybe, you know, we should touch on how people have overcome that a little bit. Um, Pam, do you want to chime in on that? You're on mute, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I just saw that immediately. Um, I was such an imposter at all in all this. I was on mute. I couldn't speak. Um, no, I, I, I researched this quite some time ago. And while it's true, all high achievers do uh, experience many times the imposter syndrome, women get out of it differently, I've found. Oh. Um, there's, there's a few things about uh, the emotional state of many of the women that, um, you know, uh, are going through the imposter syndrome that make it sort of a, a, a dip and dive kind of a thing that, that maybe the man, uh, I, I don't like the us and them conversation because I think both, both, both genders could use both kinds of, of exit strategies, if you will. But I find that there's just a couple of few little tweaks. And, and one of them is um, I've oftentimes heard women talk about not being able to find the mentors or the role models in their lives because they have to think of a man as a role model or as another woman. And it's, you know, all of the sort of difficulties, especially growing up in the 80s that we all or I had, you know, and, and all of that. And so what I what I ask a lot of the women coming through the, the, um, the imposter syndrome 
to do is to create beforehand a personal board of directors. Not just one mentor, but many. Find the person that loves you unconditionally, the kind of person that calls your bullshit, the kind of person that laughs at your jokes, the person that gives you business ideas, Oprah. I even have my father who's passed away you know, in my mind and, and I have a little frame with all those little spots to put a picture and I just, I keep mine on my desk. And, um, you know, so it, it pays to have more than one mentor because I think that some of them will give you parenting advice or being a sister or medical or anything. Just make sure you know who you go to for a lot of these things. Because when you find yourself stuck or feeling like the imposter, there's going to be a person that can, can be there with you. And, and that was one of the things I found works for men and women. Again, I don't like the us or them mentality, but I found women really resonated with that. And one of the thing that they, actually two of the things, but one in particular, dealt with uh, the maternal instinct. And I know that, um, I know that there's been a lot of studies about doing the, 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 the power play or what do you know stand in front of the mirror with your arms outstretched and and I don't disagree with that I don't know that I always it doesn't always work for me because I stand in front of the mirror and I go yeah but it's still you and you got your hands in the air okay so I think okay so I ended up finding a, a picture of myself when I was younger before I sort of you know took my ego internal sort of you know, voices started saying, are you sure? Are you sure? This, this little me that was about seven thought she could do anything. And, and that inner child that I would never want to hurt a young child. And obviously my maternal, you know, instinct looks at this picture and says, we got this and it's me. And so it was a very interesting time because we found that the power poses didn't always work every single time. And I, I again, I'm not pushing back on that research but I really appreciated the idea of looking at this picture of this just, you know, me with a, that look on my face when I was about six or seven, I guess, before it all sort of, you know, became a little bit uh, uh, more, the, the world kind of took over, I guess, if you will. And, and that makes a difference because I will not hurt that little girl. And that maternal instinct in me allows me to, you know, just really believe that we've got this and I go in and I take her with me. Um, and the third oh, thing, Pam, Pam, as you say that, I'm thinking of that girl on Wall Street. Yes, that they have that the image I have in my head when you said Absolutely. that. Absolutely, <laughs> and I, you know, I don't, I didn't mean to to push this off into men and women, but when I'm working with women and the imposter syndrome, there's just this element of. You know, when I was in, in the 80s, I had shoulder pads and I put on a business suit to go to a, an interview, but that was not my outfit. That was a guy's outfit. And I, I it feels like a, women have, have had this different kind of imposter syndrome in business sometimes because, you know, I know we've tailored the, the suit to be great for us, but we never fashioned business from women. We don't know literally what feminine leadership looks like at all times. So I think sometimes when there, you have the imposter syndrome and then you have just the feelings that, you know, of, of access, you know, that we, um, the, in business that we sometimes don't feel we have, I then take them through a point of about six polarities that we need to understand about ourselves. And that helps people feel a little less, a little more uh, confident in business. But other than business, I would say that that baby picture, that, that not baby baby, but that young girl and the personal board of directors have just done wonders for so many of the women that we've helped through the imposter syndrome. You got to have it in your back pocket because you never know when it's going to come up. It comes up. So true. Right, and right when you a six step process, Pam? Say it again? Did you say it's a six step process that you have to overcome it? it, it it's a, in, the, in the business world to kind of take away that feeling of imposter, you know, I want to know the business I run as me. I think women, many times when I work with entrepreneurs, I run, um, I used to be an investment banker before I uh, did my grad studies in psychology. So understanding the, the way that people take on entrepreneurship startups, um, women in particular, uh, again, I, I, I don't mean to mislead in any way, but when I'm looking at that under, underserved market, a lot of times women will tell me that they, they either don't have a business, I just have this knitting business. I'm like, that's a business. Or, or they'll say, uh, you know, um, 
I need to aspire to become Guy Kawasaki or a man or another person. And I, I want to say, no, you've got everything you need right with you. And so I found the six things that they needed to understand about themselves so they knew the kind of business they run as themselves. And it helps men too, again, but women just in particular put on that business suit and and the white shirt and the little paisley bow tie that turned into a rose. And we tried to be like men, but women. And, and you know, I just want to I just want to say authentically women um, just maybe have a slightly different imposter syndrome. That's all I'll say when it comes to business. So I'm going to listen to you because you have half a dozen businesses that you run successfully all over the world. Um, so I definitely am heeding your advice. I'm wondering how many of you are able to climb out of that imposter syndrome? Do you have these tools to help you dig out of it? Because we all face it, right? We all have it. What are some of the things that you guys do? And I will tell you that all successful people who I've interviewed do face imposter syndrome. The first time I met an Olympic athlete, I actually asked him, I said, what, he was in Rio. And I said, what was it like in the village, in the Olympic village? And he said, intimidating. I said, intimidating, you're an Olympic athlete. I'm sitting here on the couch. He said, no, you don't understand. You go into the weight room and you have people, you know, if they did one extra repetition of something, they can beat you and they're bigger than you and faster than you, or, you know, had different coaching than you or had a better, bre better breakfast than you. So he said, it's full of that. And when I realized that the Olympic athletes, gold medalists had imposter syndrome, then that gave us the right to have it as well, right? Um, even if we never get to that Olympic stage, if they have it, we can have it. So what are some of the things that you guys do to overcome it? Yeah, you guys don't need to raise your hand. Just <laughs> I, think, I think part of, it, part of it is to accept the fact that there are always going to be people who are smarter than you or prettier or more accomplished or just seem to make it look easier. Like that's just the way it is. That's right. Um, however, no one will ever be you. You are the only one of you and your gift to be you in all of your broken, mysterious, whacked out, whatever it is, is the best version of you that's ever going to hit the planet. And it's none of your concern how other people are going to feel about it. Like, like they're either going to like it or they're not, or gonna, they're going to wish you were taller or shorter or smaller or smarter or less mouthy or, you know, like whatever. But that's not your job. Your job is to be you to the best of your ability and day after day bring your very best self. And if you do that, and you, you are not an instrument of harm and you're true to yourself and keeping your, your sights firmly on what you believe to be most important. And like for me, that's just me and my kids. Anything else is ballast, truly. Um, if I'm just doing that, you'll get to where you want to go or, or you won't, but the journey will be a delight. That's it. Yeah, and the journey will be authentic because, you know, be yourself because everyone else is taken. It's like, uh, here's the deal. My father used to say something to me when I was a little girl. He used to say, look, Liana, half the world is going to love you and the other half the world isn't. My suggestion to you as you grow up is just go stick with the people who love you because the rest are not important. And it's so interesting for me to see, look, I'm, I, I work in, a, uh, Pam, first of all, I love everything that you're saying and I just want to go have dinner with you. So just wanted to put that out there just so you Come know. Come to New York, Liana. We can, yeah, we I'm coming. I'm coming. I swear to God, I just <laughs> want to jump through the thing and come to New York. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, I work with people like Cher and Diana Ross and I, I've had people in my sphere. So I provide transformation through the empowerment of wardrobe. I like go in and do self-image therapy. And it's like when we can get this masterpiece to feel like the masterpiece that it is, it doesn't matter what's happening in the rest of the world. Just go be yourself. You can be the pebble in someone's lake. And I realized over the years of working with these beautiful, powerful, very talented people in the industry, 
no matter how good their voice was, no matter how skinny they were, no matter how beautiful they were, at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, there's always this, mm, am I good enough? Standing in front of a mirror, a gorgeous woman, almost six feet tall, perfectly designed body. I put on a dress, I come back, she's sobbing. I say, why are you crying? And she says, Liana, I cannot believe that the beautiful woman in that mirror is actually me standing here. Wow. I am not that beautiful. This is an award-winning actor. Wow. So when you, or when I've seen this happen, and, and, and these are obviously all imposter, we all have it, you know, like they call it the manager syndrome, that someone's going to knock on our door and find out that we're just fake and we're not real because unless we have all these shingles on the wall and then, you know, even then someone's going to find out. It's this understand. It's like a Damocles sword hanging over our heads when, you know, we're constantly afraid that it's going to come cut our neck off. There's a piece that uh, Jacqueline just said, you know what? You're great. And waking up in the mirror and seeking your own greatness rather than your guilt, I'm going to say it again, it's like, it's much less aggravating to just go, you know what, you're, you're good. You did, this is good. Show up as good enough is good enough. That's right. Perfection is so damn overrated. It's like, you know, our boobs are going to sag. We're going to, butts are going to get bigger. It's just the way it is. Get with the program. <laughs> well, if we're waiting for perfect, it's never going to happen. Right. So sometimes good is good enough. And actually, it, most um, of the time, I, I think. classes with officers at West Point, And I thought they, you know, everything had to be perfect. And they said, done is good. That's right. What do you mean done is good? No, no, you need to do A plus work. Done is good. And they never did see work, right? <laughs> but they knew that sometimes it has to be good enough so you can go on to the next thing. Don't worry mm -hmm. about perfect. It's never going to happen. Yeah, what they say, the perfection is the enemy of something. There's a saying in America, perfection is the enemy of good. It's like you, we get to a place where perfection is just going to stop any kind of embodied mindful action in this moment. Right. And the mindful embodied action in this moment is from the heart and from the body. And the perfection is from the mind. And it's, it, it's the two shall never meet. So I always say, you know, just take one tiny little action towards it and it'll be good enough. What do you think a tiny action should be? For me, the way that I share in the world is that if I can just look at myself and see what, what my good enough is, even if it's just writing it down in the morning, mm. just the fact that I wrote it down, because there's a, this, there's a different brain mechanism when I take a pen to paper different than typing, different than speaking. And then I, and it's looking back at me. And sometimes all it is, is making your bed. You know, there's a, there's a philosophy that just making your bed in the morning, like when you ask me what's the tiny action, making your bed. Do you know how many people the don't Navy make SEAL. their bed? Mm -hmm. The Navy has the Navy SEAL. Yes. Navy who wrote, who, yes. Who gave that speech? Yes. Make your bed. Because and, then you accomplish something. Yeah, and so there's, there's one more thing I want to say, and I've been talking a lot, but commitment is greater than emotion. Mm. And commitment precedes emotion. So if I don't feel like it, I really don't care if I feel like it or not. What's my commitment? What am I committed to? Am I committed to giving away the three pounds or am I more committed to eating the cookie? Obviously, if I'm committed to giving away the three pounds, I am not going to eat that cookie. And I'm saying that because I haven't had sugar in a month. So it's like when you're real in the reality of this moment, okay, wait a minute, uh, there's the cookie and there's my vision. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's an, act that's an embodied action towards commitment. Commitment is just blah, blah, blah if we're speaking. But when my actions take the foundation towards that commitment, then I'm actually onto something good. Yeah. Now I want to talk about um, 
one tip that I use for imposter syndrome has to do with the box, like the box behind me. You know how sometimes you get thank you notes and thank you emails, right? And very often it means absolutely nothing to the person who's sending it, but it means everything to me. I actually print those out and I have a whole box in my office and I have a box here of thank you notes I've received over the years. And during those days, what, you remember what Isaiah said early on, what do you do when you lose your passion, when you, know, you can't find your why, you didn't hit your why yet. I open the box and I look through those notes to remind me why I do what I do. And it's so powerful, so powerful being able to open that box. Brad, you were gonna share? Yeah, I, I want to think about on that and, and tie in a couple different uh, things, um, including something that I, that I should not have left out before, but it definitely ties in with what you're saying right here. Um, and first of all, let me also mention, I recognize that there can be gender differences when you're talking about the imposter syndrome and when you're talking about self-esteem. And I thank writers like Deborah Tannen, who you know, is one of those magnificent people who like really laid out, mapped out the differences in communication and our psyches and all that. So recognizing that, but still, um, getting back to passion, there's another, there's a, the other side of the coin with passion that gets right to what you were just saying, Ruth, and which gets into my solution for imposter syndrome is inspiration. And inspiration, because I'm not the one who's in the camp of, well, just plod through. Um, to me, it's about inspiration. In your case, Ruth, you were just describing that box of positivity. For you, the inspiration is positivity. Awesome. The important thing is figure out what works for you when it comes to inspiration. That's also part of my story as I, that I should have mentioned earlier when you asked me is that, you know, there were certain people that, you know, the words of certain great leaders when I was a kid, JFK, MLK, RFK, those were the guideposts that sent me in the direction of racial justice and social equity before we even, you know, they were, the phraseology was different back then, but uh, that, that was my inspiration. And so when it comes to like the question that was asked earlier, what happens when you lose your passion for a while? The question to, to me, the answer to that is to reconnect with why you're there. Reconnect with your inspiration. Mm -hmm. Find your inspiration. Maybe, and one of those important things is it's not the same for every person. And maybe it's not the same for you today that it was last year. And it's a question of sometimes you have to try different things until, you know, the, the spaghetti hits the wall and sticks. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you think, you know, life is an evolution, obviously. And sometimes what worked for us before, we're looking for a different kind of inspiration. But when you find your inspiration, that's when you get fired up and you want to go forward. And that also ties into with self-esteem because I believe once you have your inspiration, you know your purpose. That gives you your passion. That gives you confidence, self-confidence. So that even, and here's where, you know, I, with, you know, with great deference to Deborah Tan and uh, differentiation, you know, in, even in a workplace where certain male, you know, if it's a male dominated workplace, when some women are, you know, it's a question of, I, I don't remember who the great wise person was who said this, um, but I, I, I know it was a woman who said, no one can make you feel bad unless you let them. Uh, it might've been Maya Angelou, I'm not sure. Eleanor um, Roosevelt. Uh, there you go. So, but that's a that's very person important. Who wasn't even born in this country? Yeah, she said nobody can make you feel bad without your permission. Without your permission, I exactly. So that to me is a huge part of of self confidence and self esteem. So getting back to you know just going full circle, uh, when I had you know when I started off on the hill and I was you know 27, 28 or whatever, and I realized sometimes you know that you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. Then I look around at other people and I realize they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and, you know, part of it is that great equalizer of the human experience. There were some people who certainly knew much more and those were the people who I, you know, chose to, you know, shut up and listen to and be a sponge. But those were, you know, there was a certain set of those and then a lot of other people were winging it too. So then a question was, who do I trust more, me or them? Okay. Imposter syndrome done. Wow. Ruth, can we talk about, um, can I just give a tip for a practical box of happiness? 
Yes. And inspiration. And you don't need to I, ask permission. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, you know, there's this thing of saying like, okay, well, how are you going to get this box of happiness and inspiration? And this is um, something I've done with uh, lots of nonprofits that I've worked for um, as uh, ways to um, elicit these huge testimonials without having to go out and hire people to make a, a giant testimonial campaign. But you could totally jerry-rig this concept for yourself. Um, you don't want to do it. Just empower your friend to do it for you. Okay, so let's say Pam's having a birthday, Pam's having a celebration, whatever. So tribute.co, I put it in the chat, is a friend of mine, Andrew Horn from Renaissance. He has this amazing platform that basically sends out a thing saying, make this quick 60 second video on why Pam is so inspiring. Awesome. And then it all, you don't have to do anything more than feed in your 15 emails. Then what you get back are all of these videos about from your friends and your teachers and, you know, past boyfriends, like all the stuff of why Pam is the most amazing person on earth. And I feel like everybody should have this thing that you could just play that say, you know what, you're a rock star. You're great. It didn't matter what you accomplished today. Maybe you just made your bed. Maybe you made bread, whatever. But you're awesome just because you're you. And I know you really, really well. And I feel like everybody should have that magic thing. So I think he has this awesome platform and it's super cheap and great. And I think everybody should do it. Oh, or find a friend to do it for you. What's it called again? It's called tribute.co. Tribute.co. That brings up something. Uh, you remember when they said they were talking about, have you ever heard the word agency? They were talking about how Obama's, can, uh, ca, or the women in Obama's cabinet or whatever used to say, used to take up for each other if somebody took the idea away. From, it reminds me of that. You're talking about the testimonials, you know, that you should have around you all the time. I also believe men and women could, could really benefit from agency. You know, like somebody sort of selling you or introducing you. So I, I was just sort of dovetailing off of your idea about, you know, the tribute thing, because I think that would just be awesome if we all had one of those. It'd be like, who was it? Isn't it Chris Gates that used to do the end of the Renaissance? He would say something like, uh, you know, if everybody could just love me as much as my dog, you know, like when your dog loves you, that everybody should love you that much. And I think that tribute thing is amazing. But I also believe that we can be there for each other and say more about someone else than they can say about themselves, which I just think is a wonderful thing. And it just made me think of that, Jacqueline, when you brought that up. Absolutely. I, I totally Thanks. agree. There's not enough championing. For sure. Championing. We need to do that more. And I think we have one minute left. And I think I want to talk next week about um, how people can show gratitude and amplify the voices of other people. Because all the successful people have other people who are also campaigning for them. They have sponsors, essentially. So we talked about mentors and we definitely need to talk more about how you find a mentor. Um, Brad talked about you need a mentor and Pam said you need a team of mentors. She called them a board of directors, board of advisors. So how do you find these people? Who should be on it? And also how to amplify the voices of the people around you. So I think we're going to, those will be our topics next week. If everyone's game, I would love to have everyone back uh, so we can learn from such high achievers as yourself. Any last last thoughts from everyone anyone One yeah the fact the fact that you guys the fact that you guys whoever's watching the fact that you guys are watching that's a big commitment that's one of the actions that you're taking towards blossoming your own future so pass this along to other people even if one sentence you know landed on your heart that gave you agency and go now go give that agency to someone else <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you, Ruth, for putting this together. Thanks for joining me. I am addicted to being around high achievers and learning from them. And one of the things I realized is high achievers are always learning more. They are always there to learn more and they will learn it from anyone and everyone, senior to them, junior to them, their peers. 
So that's what I'm hoping we can just get together and learn from each other and pass on what we can and get a whole new generation of high achievers. They produce 400% more than an average person. So sounds good. Thanks everybody. Thank this was fun.